Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40k Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and you are watching One Mind Syndicate. Today we ask the question, why was the Imperium so easily converted to the Imperial Creed when the Emperor himself was against the worship of his divinity? If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40k content every single day. And if you have any questions or suggestions, just comment down below. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on why the Imperium converted to the Imperial Creed. To best understand how the Imperium of Man could so easily succumb to the Imperial Creed and the teachings that stood in direct contrast to the Imperial Truth, we must look at the corruption of some of the Imperium's most devout atheists and followers of the Imperial Truth, the Iterators. An Iterator was an Imperial propagandist and educator who was a part of the Imperial Corps of Iterators created by the Emperor of Mankind to accompany every expeditionary fleet of the Great Crusade during the late 30th and early 31st millennium. The Corps of Iterators were created by the Emperor specifically to spread and reinforce the atheist and rationalist imperial truth among all worlds conquered during the Great Crusade and brought into imperial compliance. It was said that the Iterators were selected through a process even more rigorous than the induction mechanisms of an Astarte. A common imperial saying was that one in a thousand might become a legion warrior, but only one in a hundred thousand is fit to be an Iterator. To be an iterator, a person had to have a certain rare gift that failed to justify simple physical or genetic enhancements, including psychological insight, articulateness, political genius, and a keen intelligence. The latter could be boosted, either cybernetically or pharmaceutically, and the mind could be tutored in history, ethics, politics, and rhetoric. A person could be taught what to think and how to express that line of thought, but he could not be taught how to think which was the critical specialty of the iterator. Yet iterators were not simply schooled in the art of public speaking, they were also trained in both sides of the business of persuasion. Seated amongst the crowd, iterators could rile it up into enthusiasm with a few well-timed responses, or equally turn a ramble against the speaker. In this way, the iterators were actually the precursors of those imperial agents who would become the commissars of the imperial guard after the reformation of the Imperium following the Horus Heresy. Iterators often mingled with audiences, especially on newly conquered Imperial worlds, to bolster the effectiveness of their colleagues doing the actual speaking. Most Iterators could be found within the great archive chambers of the Astartes battle barges that led the Great Crusade's many expeditionary fleets. These archives contained ancient books, hololiths, and data slates left from the ancient past of Terra. Some stretched back into the Age of Strife, or even the Dark Age of Technology. Iterators were expected to hold tutorials for the Astartes of their fleet, to educate them in other aspects of human knowledge for the glorious days when the Great Crusade at last came to its end, and peace reigned across the Emperor's vast realm. The most famous and perhaps skilled of the Iterators was Primary Iterator Cairo Sinderman who served as the chief iterator for the Warmaster Horus' 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, and dwelled aboard the great flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. His eventual corruption speaks volumes of the pervasive strength of chaos. Cinderman was a particular favorite of Captain Garviel Loken of the Luna Wolves, with whom he often discussed the weightier matters of philosophy and the reasons why the Emperor had undertaken the Great Crusade to force other human cultures into his Imperium by diplomacy if possible, but by force if necessary. Cinderman was a dedicated atheist and powerful proponent of the Imperial Truth until the day during the Luna Wolf's conquest of the world designated as 6319, when he and several remembrancers from the 63rd expedition witnessed the demonic possession of the Luna Wolf's battle brother, Xavier Jubal. To see what could only be described as a demon, called every one of Cinderman's most cherished beliefs into question. He spent months after the incident, cooped up in the vengeful spirit's archive chambers, hunting for answers in the knowledge of the human past. He was particularly concerned by one burning question. Why would the Emperor have promulgated the atheist doctrine of the Imperial Truth, if he, as humanity's greatest psyker, was keenly aware that such entities existed within the Immaterium? Cinderman eventually spoke with Euphrates Keeler, the remembrancer who had taken hololiths and images of Jubal's hideous transformation, 
but had come to grips with her own confrontation with the demonic by becoming a devoted follower of the Lecticio Divinatus, the growing imperial religious cult that believed in the divinity of the emperor and ultimately laid the foundation of the imperial cult and the ecclesiarchy. Sinderman attempted to use fragments of texts and images taken by Keeler and other remembrancers to decipher the religious texts sacred to the Wordbearer's Legion, known as the Book of Lorgar, which supposedly held the collected wisdoms of many dark priesthoods and superstitious faiths across the galaxy, and had been created after the Primarch Lorgar had completed his infamous pilgrimage decades before. While reading a portion of the text aloud from the heretical tome, Cinderman inadvertently summoned a lesser demon from the warp that began to damage the library stacks of the archives aboard the vengeful spirit, until Euphrates Keeler banished the creature back into the immaterium through the exercise of her extraordinary faith in the Emperor, after which she fell into a coma-like state. This second encounter with the demonic broke Cinderman's remaining tenuous belief in the atheism and materialism of the imperial truth and forced him to confront the reality that he lived in a universe where spiritual beings did exist and could hunger for the lives and souls of a human being. In such a universe, the only thing that could protect man was the power of other supernatural beings. Thus Cinderman came to exchange the imperial truth for a new faith in the divine emperor as embodied in the teachings of the Lecticio Divinatus. By this time, the corruption of chaos had wormed its way deep into the War Master Horus and most of his renamed Sons of Horus Legion. And so with the aid of Captain Cruz of that legion, Cinderman, the Remembrancer Oliton, and Keeler managed to escape the vengeful spirit during the start of the Battle of Isfan III. They made their way to the Imperial Frigate Eisenstein. They were taken in by the Death Guard Loyalist under the command of Battle Captain Nathaniel Garo and escaped from the Isfan system to Terra after many trials and tribulations to warn the Emperor of his son's Horus' betrayal. The spread of the Imperial Creed is credited to the various Imperial cults that sprang up after the Horus heresy, and while there were some populations pushed to believe in the divinity of the Emperor by authoritarian regimes that would eventually become the Ecclesiarchy, the truth is that the average imperial citizen could not return to the rational thinking of the imperial truth after experiencing the countless chaos incursions that occurred during the Horus heresy. The imperial truth could not stand up to the very real and dangerous powers of the warp. Cinderman's eventual worship of the emperor goes to show that believing in the emperor's divinity gave humanity the much needed hope to survive in the aftermath of the deadliest civil war in human history. And those are 40 facts as to why the Imperium so easily converted to the Imperial Creed after the Horus Heresy. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It really goes to show you that um, it's, it's just something that you don't really ever think about, but uh, whenever we get comments about the uh, Great Crusade and the Imperial Truth and how the world would be much better if humanity would have just focused on um, believing in the Imperial Truth and adopting atheist beliefs, at the end of the day, the Chaos Gods were still around. Um, even the last god, Slanesh, was born during the Dark Age of Technology. Um, so it would have, or the Age of Strife, I guess. Well, kind of in the middle, in between those two. Um, but it just goes to show you that they were around. So whether they believed in uh, chaos or not, um, chaos would have eventually like come out and the whole belief of the imperial truth would have, would have collapsed um, because uh, just warp does exist. Uh, alien, or not aliens. <laughs> um, ghosts and, and, and demons do exist. So they were uh, screwed whichever way they turned. Now this also does beg the question... Um, is the belief in the Imperial Creed um, actually really good for the Imperium because it did give them hope, it gave them aspirations, uh, and it's interesting um, that some of the most loyalist uh, individuals uh, within the Imperium ended up being um, the people worshipping the Lecticio Divinatus, uh, which was a corrupted book um, by Lorgar. So in a way, because right now Lorgar is still alive, he's he's on his homeworld, um, basically meditating in the, in the in the warp. He has a demon world, and he's he's been stuck in his chamber all along. 
Uh, and I, I understand that most people believe that um, the emperor is actually a god. He's the god of, of order or the god of um, courage, whatever, whatever, the light, basically. Um, so if that's the case, we all know that gods don't have uh, time and space. So could the god emperor, the current god emperor, so the embodiment of light and good in the immaterium could that have actually spoken to Lorgar in the past um, and actually like planted the seed to say hey worship me uh, because I'm going to need more power for the future and maybe when Lorgar does wake up um, or does come out of his uh, chamber he'll come to the realization that he has he had been speaking to the god emperor all along and um, it just so happens that um, the god emperor um, has, is not bound by time and space, whereas the emperor of mankind, the one that's sitting on the golden throne, was bound by all those things. Uh, but in, at the end, it's like all cyclical, just because, um, or not even cyclical, but just chaos gods, including the emperor, could like jump over time, space, and, and just linear uh, moments in time and whatnot. Comment down what you think, what type of theories does that spark in your mind? Um, if you guys enjoyed this video, share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media you guys use. Don't forget we're having a giveaway going on right now. If you check out our 40 facts on the, no, sorry, the daily life of the Imperial Veteran, we have a, a, um, a giveaway where which you can participate in. Just jump over there. And we also announced the winner of one of the... Um, the giveaways from the past, the No No Fear box set. Uh, that person has not contacted us yet, so make sure to uh, check that out because you might have won. Um, no response yet. Uh, if there is no response by the end of the week, then we'll just um, announce a new winner from that same video from the past. But um, thanks for everything, guys. Don't forget we have a Patreon. If you want to get some additional content, jump on over to Patreon. But with that said, this was Gershwin with One Mind Syndicate signing out. Oh, <laughs>